Hi, I'm Linda McNamee and welcome to Something to Talk About. Tonight, in case you can see my lamp, we will be talking about animal adoption. So what kind of furry creature would make a good roommate or companion for you? But before we begin, I would like to mention that if you have a question or comment, please feel free to email me anytime at talk at bcattv.org. If you have a suggestion for a future topic, if you have a question or comment about tonight's show, I'd love to hear from you. And to get some business out of the way, I would like to thank the crew for this evening. Colleen Moore is director extraordinaire, so thank you, Colleen, for giving up yet another Wednesday night to come here to BCAT and help me out on the show. We also have a full crew this evening. We have Joan Rolfe and David Downey on camera tonight. So thanks guys for getting some close-ups of my four-legged furried guests, as well as the two-legged human ones. And I'd also like to thank Daniel Downey and Tatiana Hawkins for to, uh, coming tonight and giving up their evening to help work on the show. And I'd also like to thank Mike Duval and Corey McNeil, who are staff members here at BCAT. And without them, none of this would be possible. And lastly, I'd like to thank my husband, Paul, for staying home at Daddy Date Night. And I'm going to try really hard over the next hour to not bring home another cat. It's going to be tough. So right now, I would like to welcome and introduce our wonderful guests, human guests. We have Crystal Arnott and Sherry Gustafson. 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 I knew I'd screw that up. <laughs> and as soon as I saw it, I'm like, oops, who work with the Lowell Humane Society and care for lots and lots of wonderful creatures. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for having Thanks. us. And I'd like to start out, and you guys can fight over who gets to go first. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your backgrounds, where you grew up, where you went to school, and how you became interested in working for the Lowell Humane Society? Sure, you wanna go first? Um, sure, <laughs> I'm Sherry, I actually, Grew up in central Illinois, so wow. um, came out this way probably about 10 years ago. And um, really, I have an art degree, so I went to a okay. university and got a printmaking degree. Mm -hmm. And I really came into the animal field when I happened to go up to uh, the MSPCA Nevins Farm to adopt a gerbil um, and got hooked. And I've been in sheltering now for about the last eight years. Wow. And I've been with Lowell Humane for a little over a year now. So Okay. What brought you out from Illinois, though? The job or? Um, my husband is actually in the science field, so. Oh, okay. It's all Boston. The family. Yep. So, and Crystal, how about you? What's um, your story? I grew up around here. I grew up in Lawrence and went to an agricultural high school, okay. Essex Aggie, out in Middleton. And about seven years ago, I got involved building the dog park in Lowell. And uh, that okay. was a really fun thing to do. Um, and doing that, I realized it would be really fun to help raise money for an animal-related organization. So I headed over to the animal shelter. They were hiring. And I Sweet. got in on the, you know, um, as an animal care staff and then moved up from there and now I'm the shelter manager. Cool. So you really so. don't need a veterinarian degree to work with animals. You just have to love the little furry ones. Yeah, definitely. You just have to have the passion Excellent. and we can train you. <laughs> okay. And can you guys introduce our fuzzy little guests here? Sure. Um, you have Raj in your lap there. He is about five weeks old. He has been living in a foster home, uh, and he'll stay there for about another three weeks okay. until he's old enough to be adopted out. And his sister is crashed in my lap here. <laughs> Her name is Penny, so she's about five weeks old as well. Um, they came in as strays. They were found in a bush in Lawrence Ooh. by a postal carrier. And um, they unfortunately didn't find the mom. They just found a litter of kittens. They were very, very sick when they came in, um, but they're doing well now. Um, so they'll be looking for a home in a few weeks. Raj just woke up <laughs> and he's purring. Ah. And, and Sherry. I have Sheldon. Uh, so Sheldon is actually a four month old um, lot mix who was a stray. He was found in Wilmington with his siblings and his mom and dad probably right around Memorial Day. So there was a group of about nine rabbits that we spotted down that way and have been catching them. And he's the last little boy up for adoption at Lowell Humane. Now, you had said earlier that it took you like six weeks 
to trap? How do you go about trapping? It's animals? not easy to catch rabbits that have been released into the wild. Um, the babies were a little bit easier. We actually, um, there was a crew of about four of us, um, mostly volunteers who would go out there three or four times a day with nets, to be honest. Wow. Um, t with nets and ring pens and we're ca crawling around construction equipment catching these little guys. Um, the mom was the most elusive and she was living over at the Wilmington train station. Oh, wow. Took us a full month and a half before we were able to snag wow. her. But she's now up at Lowell Humane doing great. Uh, just got spayed and currently up for adoption. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay, it just hit me now. We have Raj and Penny and Sheldon. <laughs> I do not watch The Big Bang Theory, but something sounds kind of familiar. <laughs> Big Bang Theory fans. Yep, Sheldon was the first one with, with the name, and then uh, we realized these guys needed <coughs> names too, so we just kind of flew with it. There you go. <laughs> I love it. So what are the main differences? I know we talked about earlier. Um, you guys are from the Humane Society, mm -hmm. and I'm more familiar with the MSPCA up at Nevin's Farm. What are the differences? Are you guys like competitive organizations, or like they like the other, <laughs> the other animal <laughs> rescue league? Or no. So um, what are the similarities, differences? Do you work together? Yeah, we have. We're very, very similar. A lot of our policies are the same, uh, if not similar. Um, and we're, we're not competition. We all work really closely together. I think it's one of the nicest things about the Northeast is that there's a really tight community of animal welfare workers and we all um, work together to do what's best for the animals. Uh, if one shelter is overwhelmed with animals, we'll transfer to each other to help each other out. Um, and so I think it's, it's a really nice community that we have um, and we all work together uh, to, to do what's best for the animals. Now, are most, I know I didn't have this on my cheat sheet, so feel free to say I don't want to answer this, but does it seem like more of the shelters in the Northeast are becoming no-kill shelters or? It's, that's a touchy subject. Um, I think a lot of it is just lack of awareness of what those um, catchphrases really mean. Okay. Um, to be a no-kill organization means to never make a euthanasia decision. But the reality is some animals show up at the shelter in desperate desperate medical, yeah. Yeah, a desperate medical state. Um, or if an animal is really dangerous, um, there are certain animals that but you know, it's not usually a space issue. Oh, we have too many animals, so we yeah. have to. Okay. Right. Yeah. We're at sounds... Lowell Humane. Okay. I, you know, speaking for ourselves only at Lowell Humane Society, we don't make euthanasia decisions based on space or time. Uh, we have some animals who've been with us, you know, for six, seven months mm -hmm. before they find a home. Uh, and as long as they're healthy and friendly, and safe to work with, we are really committed to finding them a home. Excellent. But we do, we consider ourselves an open admission shelter because there are those animals who we feel are either too dangerous to be mm -hmm. in the community um, or, you know, their quality of life due to medical issues are just yeah. not, it's so not what we like think is fair. So they've been like strays for too long or? Um, it's not usually stray, okay. you know, stray animals. A lot of, we work with a lot of medical issues, so okay. it has to be pretty dire, okay. um, a, you know, pretty serious issue. But um, animals who, usually we see more aggression problems with animals that are under socialized rather than strays. Um, a lot of strays can, are usually friendly. They just got okay. away from home or, um, you know, unfortunately were abandoned by their families. Oh. So, How can someone abandon yeah. such <laughs> an adorable little thing? What type of types of animals? You had mentioned you adopted a gerbil as one of mm -hmm. your first yep. adoptees. What so other what kinds of animals do you have available at our shelter? At your shelter. Um, so currently, we have all different types of animals available. Um, we have everything from we have a lot of rabbits right now. <laughs> um, so we've been taking many rabbits. We have a lot of cats, kittens, um, dogs for sure. Um, but we also take in birds. Um, we'll have certain types of reptiles from time to time, not as many. A lot of our reptiles will go right to rescue, um, but hamsters, um, other types of pocket pets like gerbils, okay. uh, dagoes, ferrets. We have some ferrets up for adoption. A dagoo, uh, the best way I can describe a dagoo is um, it's like a giant gerbil. Um, that's okay, what it looks like, like. Smaller than a guinea pig? It's but smaller than, than a guinea pig, okay. yeah. Um, its closest relatives would probably be the chinchilla and the guinea pig, oh, okay. um, to be honest, as far as how it acts and how it behaves. Oh, okay. Really interesting little animal. So we're beginning to see those more and more coming into shelters in the area. And guinea pigs. A yes. lot of guinea pigs right now, too. 
Well, my daughter keeps saying, how come I don't have a rabbit? I want a rabbit. <laughs> so how do animals end up at shelter? We mentioned, you know, strays or runaways. Are there, mm -hmm. you know, other ways that animals sure. become? Um, we see a lot of animals surrendered by their owners, um, a lot of financial trouble. If people are having a difficult time feeding themselves, mm -hmm. feeding their pet can also be a problem. Um, so vet bills. <laughs> vet bills are also an, an issue. I think this year we've seen a number of medical cases that have come through um, that people just couldn't afford yeah. the vet care. Um, so, you know, owner surrenders for those reasons. Sometimes moving and pets aren't allowed in the mm -hmm. new, new place okay. or they're moving out of state. And um, we also get animals from animal control. Um, so animals oh, who are found okay. as strays or are abandoned in houses come in through animal control. So and then from other shelters we it's transfer. Just, it just blows my mind how people could just like move and leave an animal there. It's like, yeah. bring them to a shelter, you know, don't mm -hmm. risk it. I mean, this was a pet, this was part of your yeah. home. And that's what we're there for. We want people to know that, you know, we're there to help. Yeah. So if you do come to a situation where you can't take care of your pet, that's why we're here. So mm -hmm. what would the process be for surrendering an animal? Um, we just ask people to come down during our weekday hours. Okay. We reserve weekends for adoptions because it gets very busy mm. for, with adoptions on the weekends. Um, but come down during the, you know, Tuesday through Friday and um, we'll give us a half hour to 40 minutes to tell us about your animal. We like to know as much as possible so we can make the best match possible. Okay. Um, and then we ask for a donation, but it's not required. You know, if you're uh, surrendering due to yeah. financial issues, we understand that you might not be able to make a donation. Mm -hmm. We just want to make sure we can help you find the best spot possible right. for your pet. Okay. Now, I'm just thinking, you know, pets for me, they're part of my family. So if I ever had to give up my cat due to financial reasons or moving reasons, is there counseling services available? I mean, I would be heartbroken if I had to leave a member of the family behind. Sure, yeah. All or of support our staff. Groups or um, I don't know if there are any support <laughs> groups out there, but there, our staff, exactly. you know, is always here to listen and talk. If you're considering surrendering, you can call us and talk about your issue, and we can sometimes point you in the right direction um, to help you prevent having to surrender your pet. We do have a pet food pantry that people can utilize oh, temporarily. Okay. So if it's, you know, they just can't feed them, maybe they just got into a car accident and mm -hmm. had to use all their money to fix that car to get okay. to work, mm. um, or, you know, something, we can provide temporary assistance as long as our food bank has food available oh, okay. um, and you know we'd rather help someone keep their pet than have their pet end up with us. Has that ever happened where somebody like changes their minds? Oh absolutely mm -hmm. I mean one of the things that um, I like to mention is you know not only do we strive to have as much compassion as we can for the animals but also for the caregivers of those animals so um, you know everyone who comes into the shelter whether it be to surrender an animal um, or for adoption mm -hmm. um, you know our best thing that we can do is sit down and talk to them um, guide them um, you know, in the in one direction or another, and really make sure you know if they're leaving with a good match or if they need to surrender their animal. Make sure that we're getting information so that we can place it in a good home. Okay, so it won't be a repeat customer, ideally. Right. Yeah. Okay, so how do you determine if you know? Obviously, if somebody's surrendering an animal, you know who the owner is, and you know that that animal is available for adoption. But are there instances where? Like if it's a stray, how do you know it's not a runaway? How do you know that the owner doesn't want it back? Is there like a waiting period or how do you make that determination before you set, you know, give an I'm animal away? In. Sure. Uh, we have, the, for the dogs, there are requirements to be held for seven days. Okay. Um, so we don't hold stray dogs at our facility. They do have to be held with animal control okay. for the town that they're found in. Now, is that because of like licensing issues and rabies issues? Um, and it's for, partially for licensing um, and to give the families an opportunity to find their pet. Okay. Um, so that is a state law, seven day mandatory oh, um, okay. hold. Um, for cats, there isn't a mandatory hold. We typically hold for 48 hours. Um, you know, we can't hold for much longer than that because space is at a premium. Yeah. Um, so we hold for 48 hours. As soon as an animal comes to us, no matter how they come in, mm -hmm. we scan for a microchip and check our lost reports okay. to make sure they're not a missing animal. Um, okay. We check on Craigslist. We, you know, communicate with now, other animal control officers. Do you guys have like a Facebook officers. page where you could say this animal yeah. just showed up? Does anybody? We do. And we take photos and post them up saying, you know, this animal just came in. Do you recognize them? And we have found a number of families that way. Oh, cool. And when they pick up, we encourage them to microchip their pet before they leave. We have microchipping at our shelter oh, okay. uh, to prevent that from happening again. Okay. A um, couple of 
questions, tangents. Um, you know, a few years ago after Hurricane Katrina hit, mm -hmm. a lot of the northern shelters had animals that were Katrina victims. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody lived in Louisiana, how would they know to look up in Massachusetts or Connecticut for their lost animal? Yeah, I think um, there was a system in place um, okay. to show you know where the animals went and they could report into officials down there oh, okay. um, there were some um, national organizations running those efforts okay. so people reported into them if their pet was missing okay. uh, and like they the Humane tried Society to is a national organization so, uh, we're a local nonprofit oh, yeah. okay. um, we're not affiliated with any national organization oh, okay. and the national organization um, is its its own entity oh, um, so okay. we're not necessarily affiliated that way we do get lots of grants and help from them okay. um, and in different ways, but we aren't necessarily attached to them. Oh, okay. Because I was thinking, you know, like Sister Thrift mm -hmm. in Burlington, all the proceeds there go to help the Humane Society, but it's a different, it's not the Lowell one. So it must be, yeah, I maybe think it's like the Framingham National. Or, oh, okay. Is there something out mid state? There's a lot of shelters. Yeah, there's in lots there. of different um, Humane Societies throughout. Okay. Um, but New they're England all like independently and owned and right. run. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm learn something every day. <laughs> uh, the other question that I thought of, um, microchipping. Mm -hmm. Long time ago, I had a cat that I got from a shelter and she came with a microchip mm -hmm. and I was given the option to either register it or not. But at that time, we're going back almost 20 years, mm -hmm. there were several different formats available and there was no guarantee that if she were lost, the shelter that she'd go to had the correct reader scanner yeah so mm -hmm. over the past 15 20 years has that been narrowed down or there are still some different formats um, okay. but now there are readers that read all the formats okay. um, that are available like a universal remote type right. thing oh okay now since we're on this tangent how much mm -hmm. does it cost to microchip your animal um, for at the Humane Society, it's typically twenty dollars, okay. um, depending on where you go. It, okay. You know, depending on what company is used. I know some veterinarians charge a different amount. Okay. Um, we use a company called Twenty Four Hour Pet Watch. Um, okay. So our twenty dollar fee covers both the registration of the chip and the chip itself. Um, it's okay. all in one. And it's like so. the size of like a little grain of yeah, rice. grain of rice. Yep, it's tiny. And it contains a number, and when you scan, you get that number, and mm -hmm. then if you register, mm -hmm. that number is for a file that has your name, the pet's exactly. name, the vet, you know, Right, that way if they get rehomed, that up, that can be updated, oh, rather than okay. storing your information on the chip if the animal was so rehomed. Okay, I just figured so. it's kind of hard to put all that yeah. information. <laughs> At least 20 years ago, it was hard to put all that information on a little yeah. tiny chip. Um, okay. Now, you mentioned some of the older animals or some of the animals sticking around the shelter, was it mm -hmm. six, seven months? Mm -hmm. What's the average shelter expectancy? Um, it's pretty great. I think it's about three weeks. Mm -hmm. That's um, it? Yep, average length of stay is wow. about three weeks. Guess what, buddy? <laughs> You'll have a permanent home by Christmas. Yeah, way less for these guys. Yeah. <laughs> You'll probably have a permanent home by <laughs> Labor Day. <Yeah. laughs> so, excellent. So, are there Certain animals get a, that get adopted faster, like kittens. Mm -hmm. Kittens, baby, anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we do, um, some of our small animals do tend to linger a little bit longer than the kittens and okay. uh, the dogs, to be honest. Do you think that's because, like, people go to Petco to buy their gerbils and um, That could hamsters? be part of the reason, and, you know, a lot of people aren't as familiar with the care required for these type of animals um, and housing requirements for these type of animals, okay. so... Um, some of our longer term residents, I know we had um, a rabbit at our shelter that was there for almost a year before it mm -hmm. found a home. So, um, but you know, as long as they're doing well at the shelter, we'll continue to look for a home um, until we find one, which is great. Yeah. Cool. Now, if somebody, I'm probably going out of order of my questions, mm -hmm. um, if someone comes to adopt an animal, do you have any guidance available saying, no, you really don't want that Doberman, you mm -hmm should probably consider a rabbit or a gerbil because you live in a, you know, 500 square foot apartment in the middle of Lowell. Do you have any yeah, guidelines? Absolutely. I mean, one of our jobs as adoption counselors there is to not only find the best match um, within that species, but really kind of gear them if we think 
you know, maybe a dog isn't quite um, going to fit into their lifestyle, you know, maybe they should look at a cat or a small animal. So we're there to counsel them not only on one certain type of animal, but all the different animals. And okay. then within that, you know, within all the different animal personalities too. Because um, okay. each kitten isn't going to be like the next kitten. So we are really, our main goal is to find the best match for each individual family. Now, if somebody comes looking to adopt an animal, is there like space in the shelter for them to spend one-on-one -on -one time to mm -hmm. see if, you know, because pets have personality, animals have personalities. They sure do. Yeah. And, you know, you know, like one of my cats, there are two people in this world, daddy and not daddy. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just wondering, before you bring this animal home, you want to make sure that it's it's a good match. We do, and we encourage it as well. Um, we certainly have some people that come in and say, that's the one, and just point, and we encourage them to spend a little bit of time one-on-one -on -one with them and make sure that the personality is, you know, what they're looking for, Are because sure? sometimes they get in the room and realize maybe it's not the right match, yeah. and we can steer them in the direction of what might be a good match for them. Um, we also encourage families to take dogs out for a nice walk oh, and, okay. you know, see if they can handle them on the leash. Some dogs come in and don't have the best manners and they'll need work on that. So we want people to know what they're getting in for. Okay. We also have background profiles for cats that come from owners um, or you know any animal that's surrendered from an owner oh, okay. and that's part of our intake process mm. is finding out what the animal's like and what they're like in a home because okay. it's different than they are in a cage sometimes oh, okay. and we go over that background with them as well to let them know mm -hmm. what the prior owner said about the animal. Now do you have like volunteers that come in and work at socialization of the animals because Three weeks is still a long time to be mm -hmm. stuck in a, a little cage. Yeah. I mean, we have about 240 active volunteers right now. Wow. So we have a really uh, great volunteer base. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those individuals come in, they socialize the animals, they help us clean. Um, we do also have a really active foster care program um, okay. where people can take the animals, give them a break from the shelter, um, whether it be for socializing, for them to get old enough to be put up for adoption. Um, or to work on behavior. So we get a lot of information from our volunteers. Just laughing with the work on behavior. I had a cat that had some <laughs> behavior issues and I actually called an animal communicator mm -hmm. and I'm not going to ask you your opinions because you'll probably <laughs> laugh at me, but I find, found it valuable. Not for this cat. So I went to my vet, said help me out. They sent me to a behaviorist in Lexington mm -hmm. and I purchased a six, six month program and after two months, the behaviorist said, I give up. Oh, no. <laughs> like, what do I do with this cat? <laughs> the behaviorist doesn't even want it. So, okay, um, I digress. <laughs> now, we talked about animal surrendering. We talked about, you know, the life ex or the time expectancy that they'd be at the shelter. Do you ever have, like, repeat offenders? Like, if a dog just insists on running away from home, well, I know you said the dogs have... The, the waiting period. But do you find like sometimes the same animal comes back? We've definitely have had some come back um, and it can be a little frustrating at first but I like to think of it as just getting more information um, so that we can pinpoint the, okay. the perfect home for them. Um, I think sometimes when people are coming in to surrender maybe they won't give us all of the information um, okay. because they want what's best for the animal and they think maybe you know if they tell us if that they're feisty <laughs> that we won't mm -hmm. place them but knowing that information up front even if maybe some of it's not the best information mm -hmm. knowing the bad habits is really important so that we can make the best match in the next house did she oh, just somebody's talk? awake she did yeah, yeah her brother doesn't eh, not so much <laughs> <laughs> so you know um, Sherry you just mentioned that you have 240 volunteers that yep. come in. Is it just the volunteers that care for the animals? Do you have vets on st veterinarians on staff? Oh, somebody's got an itch. Um, <laughs> veterinarians on staff. Do you outsource? Do you have to bring the animals to? We do vet? have to bring our animals um, out of the shelter for vet care okay. for the most part. We do have some um, vets that do come to the shelter. Okay. So, for instance, we have the Catmobile that is there on Mondays. Um, that does a lot of our spaying and neutering for oh, our cats okay. before they go out for adoption. But we use a, a variety of different vet um, offices in the area oh, okay. for care for our animals. So, um, but yeah, for the most part, our volunteers are really helping us with basic animal care, um, okay. with the cleaning, with the socializing, um, and really with the events, the promotions, and the fundraising too okay. as well. Which we will get to yep. shortly. Mm -hmm. 
So looking at your website, there's a kids, pro you have a kids program available. So you take volunteers like from all age ranges. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me a little bit more about your kids program? What's involved in that? Mm -hmm. um, the kids program for kids under 12 isn't so much involved at the shelter. Uh, we ask them to kind of be advocates in their community and do wish list drives of items that we need. And it can be things, you know, that you purchase like paper towels or pet food or things from around the house, you know, um, to old towels and old blankets and sheets. Um, Can you take like old pillows and stuff? Because I know we don't take pillows um, okay. just because they're difficult to wash. Okay. And we do a lot of laundry. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> so um, we, you know, we ask for the kids to start out by going out to the, reaching out to friends and family. A lot of kids will do lemonade stands in the oh, summer. Fun. Um, okay. We had some kids do a hot cocoa stand in the winter mm -hmm. once. Um, so mm -hmm. fun things like that, um, just to raise money and raise awareness. Um, we've had Girl Scout troops and Boy Scout troops, other youth groups um, do okay. things within their school or church to bring awareness to homelessness um, and you know just tell people that we're there and, and that oh, okay. the animals need homes. Um, we've had kids make cage cards for the animals or what's a cage uh, card? Um, cage card just with information about the oh, animal okay. that is available I was thinking for adoption. Like, you know, <laughs> hope you find your forever home. You things know, like that too. The, yep, the kids so will the do, decorate things to hang up around the shelter, um, and sometimes they'll make signs. You know, they'll, just from home they can print out pictures of the animals and make pretty okay. signs to hang up at church or school or anywhere where, where people will see them. Looking um, for new home, Sheldon. Exactly. <laughs> so um, that's our kids program. When they sign up for things like that, they can contact us if they do a wish list drive, okay. or if they want to come in for a tour with their friends and Ooh. and um, you know do some sort of fundraiser. We can set that up for them to come in and see the shelter, meet some of the animals that they are helping to find homes for. Cool. Now, do you usually do the tour after the fundraiser or before to kind of get them excited about it? We can do either one. Um, you know, we could do a quick visit to, you know, pick up wish lists and show them around the shelter a little okay. bit and then do something bigger when they come back, you know, with the donations or after they've okay. completed our service project. I was, you know, telling you earlier that the past, my kids' last two birthdays, we've asked for, for supplies and now I think my daughter's old enough that if I brought her to a shelter and mm -hmm. showed her all the animals one, she'd want to come home with all the rabbits, mm -hmm. but it would get her a yeah, little more motivated. excited about it. Sure. And help talk it up to some of her friends and realize that she doesn't need everybody to bring <laughs> her toys. We definitely encourage people to come visit the shelter with their kids and, and you know, see what it's all about and introduce them to the idea of the animal shelter. Cool. Anytime we're open. <laughs> And then we do have a program for older kids as well. Okay, I was um, just about to ask you that. 12 to 16 year olds can take part in our Teens Helping Pets program. Okay. And they're a really fun group. It's all run by them. We're there to give them a little guidance, okay. but it's their ideas. They um, organize fundraisers, and then they also meet twice a month um, to create enrichment toys for the animals, learn about animal behavior and body language. And, What's an enrichment um, toy? Enrichment toys are things we give the animals in the cages, because the cages can be boring, uh, to keep yeah. their minds working uh, okay. and keep them busy. Okay. So the kids create those, and they're usually toys that they can work to get treats out of and things like oh, that. Oh, okay, because I'm like, feather stick? Yeah, yeah. Things like you know a toilet paper tube with some treats inside oh, crumbled up, so they have okay. to tear it open to get the treats out. Okay. Um, that they can spend a little time and a little brain power working to get the toys out. So uh, they make those, and they also plan fun events every year. Cool. So. Now, who are the events? Who's the target audience for the event? Um, the community in general. Oh, okay. uh, they do our holiday photo day <laughs> where buddy. people can bring their uh, pets to see Santa and get a photo. And they also plan our spay getty dinner, which is a fundraiser for spaying and neutering. I get it. I get it. Um, so they, you know, they're the wait staff at, for that oh, okay. every year. They do raffles, things like that. They're in parades. Um, they make banners talking about adopt, you know, adoption and what okay. we do. Um, so they're a really fun group of kids that love animals and they get to also learn about body language and how to approach a pet and that kind of thing uh, while they're there. And you mentioned you know, having your animals, your pet's picture taken with Santa. Mm -hmm. Is that more of a dog thing? Oh no, we have um, lots of people bring cats, bunnies, ferrets, iguanas. Yeah. We had a pig come on leash one year. Yeah. So, oh, wow. yeah, it's, it's a lot of My cats fun. would not put up with that yeah. at people all. People dress them up in everything. Yeah, yeah, we'd have costumes there that people can use for their animals. And fun. 
I mean, it's a really fun event. So we have raffles. Here's um, Andy. Here's my pet boa. Yeah. <laughs> yep. He's seen it all. Santa we have a is brave, very brave. Very brave yes. Santa. Santa <laughs> is very brave. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but does your teen program overlap with like any other service organization like the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, or is it like its own entity? Um, it's its own entity, but we definitely encourage them to get involved. Okay. Um, if scouts are interested in doing service projects for anything from Bronze Award to the Eagle Project, um, then you know they can definitely get involved, get in touch with us, and we'll help them through that. Um, I'm a lifetime scout, so okay. I love getting the Girl Scouts involved, and I worked at Boy Scout camps for, for many years, uh, so I love getting okay. them involved as well. So uh, if they want to do some sort of project to involve the shelter, we love to have them contact us and get those hours. Um, we also have a lot of volunteers, both in the regular volunteer mm -hmm. program as well as the teen program, mm -hmm. that are doing hours for National Honor Society and similar organizations. Oh, okay. um, so we can sign off on those hours too. Mm. Um, so if people have to get hours for those, definitely contact us. We'd love to have okay. them involved. Now, could you do like an internship program? I know that BCAT has had um, interns recently that are, you know, at least here mm -hmm. learning about television and video production and they get school credit. Now, if somebody's interested in, you know, animal husbandry or veterinary care, could they, you know, do yeah, some definitely. volunteer? Yeah, definitely. I know we have a UMass student um, interning with us in a few weeks. Yeah, yeah. we've had um, a lot of kids from the Westford Academy that have come and done internships. Okay. So it, we always are welcome um, kids to come and do an internship with us um, from everything from office work to animal care to really going out and helping with some of our special events. So, fundraising. Yeah, exactly. fundraising, absolutely. Like those are things that you don't really learn in school. Yeah. yeah. Sort of. Now, on your website, you had a tab for humane education. Mm -hmm. What is your definition of humane education? Um, it's basically just or what is it? letting the community know everything that we know and mm -hmm. how to be the best pet owners and um, the most humane member of your community. So um, we can do visits to school kids, you know, preschool kids, day, daycare providers, oh, okay. um, all the way up to adults. We've visited nursing homes, um, we've visited senior centers, and the everything in you? between. Yes, yes. always. Um, so, you know, we can do a specific topic if someone requests something, um, or we can also come with topics of our own to discuss. We like to talk about what to do if your pet gets lost a lot okay. because things are always changing with microchipping and tags and things like that. We like to people let people know what they should do immediately if their pet gets lost. Okay. We're finding a lot of people don't know, you know, who to call even. Yeah. So, you know, animal control, your vets, your local shelters. Um, so we can talk about pretty much anything <laughs> to any age level. Now, do you kind of encourage people to keep their animals indoors? Because I'm thinking, you know, when I grew up, we let our pets wander in and out of the house at will. But now, mm -hmm. I mean, we've had coyotes run through the yard. We have had, you know, various hawks that like to eat small animals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, cars, there's so many, you know, diseases. Everything is mm -hmm. out there. Do you kind of encourage people to leave their animals inside or? We do, yeah. yeah. We definitely, um, you know, there are lots of hazards outdoors for animals, especially for cats and small animals. Um, you know, obviously um, people, we encourage them to get their dogs outside on leash and hikes yeah. and um, things like that. But um, yeah, it is much Fence safer for yards. cats to be kept as indoor pets in general. Um, and for small animals, um, you know, the climate even in this area it can be really harsh on oh, rabbits, especially yeah. it gets too hot in the summer, too cold in the winter. So they do do much better in this area as indoor pets. So we definitely encourage that. Kind of going on yet another tangent, mm -hmm. you had mentioned rescuing Sheldon and his family. Yep. We have bunnies in our yard. Is there an easy way to tell if it's a wild bunny versus a domestic? There is, um, you know, basically a lot of the calls that we get around this time of year are really baby cottontails being found in yards. Okay. Um, they build really shallow nests, um, sometimes right in the middle of people's yards. <laughs> and um, people will mistake them, they'll go out and, you know, a dog might discover them or they might discover okay. them mowing the lawn. 
Um, and really, you know, one of the telltale signs of a baby cottontail, for example, would be a lot of times they are this brown color like Sheldon. Mm -hmm. Um, but when they're really small, they do have a white dot on their forehead, so that's one oh, way to really okay. tell that it's a cottontail. Um, other thing is, you know, just their body condition. Um, they're always short-haired, um, so they are, you know, the brown, short-haired. Sometimes they have the white dot as they get older. Okay. Um, they still keep that short coat. Um, anytime you have a rabbit that's found outdoors um, that is multicolored, um, you can pretty much guarantee that's a domestic rabbit that's been oh, let loose. Okay, like a calico type yep. multicolor? Yeah, okay. if it's spotted um, or if it has one of the things that you would be able to tell with Sheldon that he's a domestic rabbit is that long hair around the face oh, um, okay. and the lop-eared. Okay, um, well yeah, I figured the lop-ear yeah. thing would be a sign, but there are some, anim some rabbits that don't have loppy ears. Yep, exactly. Okay. Um, and Sheldon's mom was actually what we call a harlequin uh, rabbit, so she almost looked like a calico cat um, would be oh, the best way wow. I could describe her coat. So, um, you know, different colors um, and kind of splotches of different colors. So that's really a telltale sign that's a domestic rabbit and not a wild. Okay, sorry about the tangent. Now, you also mentioned on your website, back to the Humane Education Information Services, what does that entail? Because, you know, I'm thinking education and information are mm -hmm. kind of synonymous or related. Maybe Inf not synonymous, but... Information is uh, services are just providing information that you might not know where to find. Nowadays, okay. people don't necessarily need it as much with Google and <laughs> other yeah, search yeah. engines. Um, but there's still some people who, you know, don't have access to the Internet mm -hmm. at home. And they might need to know where the closest 24-hour emergency veterinarian okay. is. Or they might need to know... Um, you know, where a vet is that sees rabbits, because not all veterinarians see rabbits oh, okay. or exotics. Um, they might need to or know that, Yeah, they might need to know animal controls number, oh, things okay. like that. Um, so basically, if, if someone's looking for some sort of care for their animal um, and guidance on where to find that, you know, a groomer that they can trust oh, okay. or a daycare or pet sitter, oh, um, they can so call us. So you like know and, everything. Like yeah, we kind of, okay. you get to know everybody in the community <laughs> and can and refer people um, to those that we trust in the area um, okay. that we work with so all right excellent so humane education is kind of more proactive where you're going out in the community and information services is you mm -hmm. you're like the encyclopedia people come yeah. to you and you <laughs> you know turn to page 56 or whatever exactly. oh, okay so I think we touched upon this a little earlier how do you know what pet is right for you to adopt because I'm just keep thinking that my daughter who's five has a cat in the hat book all about pet adoptions and going to shelters and these are questions to ask yourself before mm -hmm. getting a pet. So there's lots of different um, things that you'd want to speak with your kids about. Okay. Um, you know, I think the biggest consideration is how much time do you realistically have? Okay. Um, you know, are you home most of the day? Are you gone throughout the day? Um, are you somebody who likes to go outdoors, who wants to take their animals mm -hmm. out on hikes or who likes to travel? Um, so all of those are big considerations and what type of pet might be the best um, one suited for you. Other things to keep in mind, you know, um, you know, financial. Um, some pets definitely can cost more than others. Yeah, um, as by far species as or by care. individual? Um, I would say it depends. Um, you know, there's okay. different, you know, for example, within, you know, dogs, there's certain breeds of dogs that might cost more medically than other oh, breeds okay. that are more prone to health issues as they get older. Okay. So that's something to consider. Um, but, you know, it also is by species, too. You know, hamster's not going to cost as much as, let's say, a cat, for example. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of different things to consider, and our job at the Humane Society is really to talk to people, get a feel of what type of, you know, expectations they have for their new companion animal and try to okay. fit them up with the best match possible. All right. So why, another loaded question, why is it important to adopt an animal from a shelter? Well, adoption, when you get an animal from a shelter, you open up a cage or in a spot for another animal waiting mm -hmm. for help. So that's a really important part of it. Um, another part of it is not necessarily being so important that you adopt from a shelter, but knowing where you're getting your pet from. Um, we encourage people to find out where the animals come from. And if it's an animal that's at a pet shop or something like that, or a breeder, you really want to look into where the animal originated. And, you know, it's a great thing to take that animal home. But if you're perpetuating the cycle of puppy mills, say, and, yeah. you know, puppies who, you know, 
came from a place that was just a warehouse of dogs in cages mm -hmm. for their lifetimes. Um, you may be helping that one animal, but what you're really hurting, you know, the mothers of these dogs that yeah. are continued, you know, continuously bred over and over again, and then just dumped once oh. they're they're not yeah. breeding anymore, and they're not socialized, and they can't be adopted because they were just little breeding machines and yeah. sitting in cages for their whole lives. Oh. So, um, you know, wherever you get your pet from, it's important to, you know, know where they're originating from. Um, and it's very easy, if, you know, if you ask questions, people should be able to give you answers and to trace back to meet the mom um, or trace back to find out where they came from. Um, and if it sounds sketchy, it probably is. Mm. Um, just looking at this little guy, he's on the move. <laughs> where are you going? Where are you going, Raj? Oh, sorry. I, I sh am thinking, <laughs> oh, this is nice and relaxing. I should have a pet every shop. Okay, <laughs> not. A little distracting. <laughs> so do you play a role when someone comes to adopt an animal to find the right match and make sure that you can find the, the correct forever home? What do you look for? Or what are th some of the things that you look for? Well, we like to have a conversation with every family that comes in um, because sometimes just asking, you know, a list of questions isn't enough to find out what they're looking for. So having a really good conversation about, you know, what they like about maybe their friends or family members' pets um, okay. or a pet they had in the past. So I figure um, out why my daughter is so obsessed with rabbits right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and, you know, going from there and really spending time talking to them about how they plan to incorporate their pet into their life. Um, we do, you know, we tell people don't jump on the first animal you see, um, even though they're really cute and cuddly, because it's a lifetime commitment yeah. that you're making and we mm -hmm. want everyone to be happy. Sure, we'd love to get every animal right out the door, but it doesn't help anyone right. if they have to come back because of an issue. So, do um, people ever leave the shelter without an animal absolutely. that come to adopt? Oh yeah. yeah, definitely. And, you know, they go home, they watch our website. Our, you know, we encourage people, you know, we want them to adopt from us, but mm -hmm. if we don't have the right animal and maybe one of us is volunteering at another shelter, because we all seem to do that. Yeah. I was about um, to say, you don't have enough of it at work. <laughs> yeah. um, maybe we know of an animal of an at another shelter or we have friends, yeah. you know, we're all friends with mm -hmm. other shelter workers. They may have posted a photo of um, the exact okay. pet someone comes in looking for and we'll say, hey, we don't have the pet for you, but go check out this other oh, shelter. We just saw okay. this posting or we just walked them or cuddled them in surgery yesterday yesterday mm -hmm. and we'll send them to the other shelter if we oh, think that's okay. the perfect match because that's our goal is just yeah. to have families happy with their pet and um, find pets the correct forever exactly. home the right forever home oh this guy is just so <laughs> fuzzy i know they're so sleepy i'm surprised they're sleeping so much oh yeah you're gonna have fun tonight at 3 a.m <laughs> when they decide to running all over the place the bathtub um so what's the Dorothy Fund? I also noticed that on your website. Um, the Dorothy Fund right now is not active. Um, oh, okay. It basically, when we have funds in it, we can offer it. Um, oh, okay. So there are donors that occasionally make donations specifically for it. Um, but it's a service to get, um, to give uh, senior citizens the opportunity oh. to adopt at a discounted rate oh, okay. since they do tend to, um, you know, sometimes have limited Fixed finance. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, the Dorothy Fund offers half off of the adoption fee um, for senior citizens oh, okay. when they adopt an adult cat. When they adopt, okay. What's considered an adult cat? Um, for us, two years or older. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so an we adult encourage cat, them not to a choose, senior cat. Yeah, we encourage them to choose, okay. you know, even older one because a lot of okay. times the personalities will really meld, yeah. really mellow. Well, older cats or cats. older animals sometimes tend to be a little more on the mellow side. For yeah. Like dogs, it takes them one or two years to get rid of all their puppy behavior. Oh, a couple of years. Unless you have a lab and then they are puppies <laughs> forever, uh, which I'm finding out with my nine-year-old lab. But, oh, okay. um, but yeah, you know, cats chill out at, at a good, you know, six, okay. seven years old. They start mm -hmm. to relax. Yeah, not my 14-year-old son. <laughs> no. She still thinks she's a kitten. Yeah. So the Dorothy Fund is, when it's functional, is mm -hmm. for senior humans. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you have a special program any time of year for discounted rates on senior animals, like animals 10 years or older? 
Um, we do sometimes. Um, we tend to do overall discounted rates. Um, okay. We've had $5 fee lines where all cats were $5 for the adoption fee. Um, I'd go home with 20 cats. <laughs> we recently had our fat cat adopt-a-thon, so it was pay by the pound. Dollar a okay, pound. I was about to say, okay, what's considered fat? Yeah. But. So um, any, I think we did any cats over 10 pounds. Yep. It was a dollar a pound, and uh, okay. we adopted out 16 cats that weekend. Wow. Uh, so it was really nice. So that, we like to have like fun. What's like your average weekend adoption rate? Uh, it really depends no, and varies. Okay. I would say like eight to 10 animals. Yeah. Um, but that was 16 just lot. cats one wow, weekend. Wow, yeah. So yeah. But eight to 10 is still a lot for two days. Yeah. Wow. Now. Sherry mentioned a foster program earlier. How, what's, what's involved in the foster program? How do you become a foster parent? Is there special training you have to go through? What kind of animals so you know, really, are you matched up with? It really depends on the family. I mean, we do get inquiries all the time about people who want to be foster homes for us, and we definitely have a big need for that. Um, our biggest need by far is probably for kittens um, okay. during this type of season. Um, but we do need foster homes throughout the year, sometimes for our cats that come in that might have URI or might be okay. um, needing some medical care before they go up for adoption. Um, we have foster homes that we need sometimes for small animals like the scoop of rabbits while they're waiting to be big enough okay. to be spayed and neutered. But for people to become a foster home, really what we'd have them do is come into the shelter, speak with us, fill out a foster home application, okay. and then we review that. We just want to make sure, you know, our biggest goals with our foster homes is that they have a nice secure location, an indoor location where they can isolate the foster animal initially okay. from their own pets. Okay, um, so it's not necessarily a requirement not to have existing pets. No, we want to make sure okay. their pets in the home, though, are up to date for, with vaccinations. Understood, um, So Fair we enough. want to make sure uh, that is set. And really, you know, it's counseling them on the care that we need for that specific animal. And we do provide training for that. Okay. So we do counsel them on what that animal needs and make sure that we find a good match for them as a foster parent. Okay. Because I know, like, just I know a couple of people who are foster parents, and they also teach, you know, pet first mm -hmm. aid. Is it a requirement to be, like, you know, licensed or Not certified in pet no. first aid and pet CPR? you know, whatever is available. For I mean, in shelter, sheltering, we're all constantly learning. So mm -hmm. we're learning from each other. We're learning from conferences we go to, um, from different organizations we volunteer with. So we don't expect our volunteers or foster homes to be fully trained before we start to utilize them. Okay. We're there to help train them and to let them know about proper care and nutrition and different areas um, that are needed in foster care. Now we talked about some of the different roles of volunteers. How would someone become a volunteer? Same as a foster parent or foster home? Um, it's basically about the same process. We do offer um, volunteer orientations um, every month. It's the second Thursday of every month from okay. 6 to 8 p.m. at the shelter. And those are really open for anyone who wants to learn more about becoming a volunteer. Okay. And I typically sign volunteers up right there on the spot. So they go to the two-hour orientation where I talk about, you know, the background of the shelter, what we do there, what type of different volunteer opportunities that we have at the mm -hmm. shelter, and give them a tour of the shelter. After that, we get them set up with volunteers that have been there for a while or with staff. Like and a mentoring program. Yep, kind of like a mentoring yeah. program to get them up to speed on animal care, what different needs that we have. And, okay. you know, our main goal is once we get our volunteers is to keep them there because they really are a big asset to us. And really, we couldn't do what we do at the shelter oh, okay. without our volunteer teams. Now, what kind of turnover rate do you have for volunteers? You mentioned 240 volunteers, 240 volunteers mm -hmm. but you also mentioned monthly trainings. So. Yep. So I would say, you know, we are striving to get a higher, um, you know, kind of sticking with our volunteers, um, okay. volunteers to stay there a little bit longer. Okay. Right now we do ask for a six-month commitment for new volunteers coming okay. on, um, and that's just really so for training purposes. Yep, two hours a week um, for or a six-month commitment. Okay. Yeah, or more. I mean, if they want to come in every day, that's great. <laughs> um, but we do want to, you know, get familiar with them. Um, it's great to see familiar faces each week because we can really give them more specialized tasks. The more Are there we get age to know them. requirements for being a volunteer? They do need to be 16 to be a normal volunteer at the shelter. Any upper limit? Nope. I think nope. my father-in-law would be a great volunteer. <laughs> so um, we talked a little bit about 
the animal care and mm -hmm. veterinary care and food. Who pays for all of this stuff? You mentioned some grants. Is it all done through grants or? Um, grants and fundraising, okay. donations are really what we re rely on for everything. Um, so we try to have fun fundraisers. Um, we put the fun in fundraising. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, we want people to know that we really appreciate every penny that comes to us. So we okay. like to try and also have fun with them when we do. So we recently had a dog named Kino who's still with us looking for a home. He's a great big Mastiff mix. He's adorable and I'm in love with him, but I have too many pets already. Um, but he's looking for a, a single pet household where he'll be the only one. Okay. Um, but he needed knee surgery, which was over $2,000. Wow. And so we, you know, got together and decided what a fun way would be to raise the money for that. And we had a barbecue right on our property uh, cool. and we had bands play and it was a lot of fun. And we raised almost $2,000 that night alone. Excellent. Um, so we really try to, you know, also get people right down to the shelter to spend time with us and see what we're doing and okay. meet the animals that they're helping oh, because I think okay. that makes a big oh, difference definitely. as well. Yeah. So, um, but it is, you know, all donations, grants, and fundraising events. Okay. Um, the adoption fees that we ask for, um, we don't typically really make any money off of those. Um, it's to cover the medical services that we provide. For that one particular animal. For that animal. Okay. And there are sometimes animals we spend a whole lot more on yeah. that we don't recoup the costs for that okay. without doing additional fundraising. Okay. Um, animals who come in who need dental surgery and, mm. you know, teeth removed. Yeah. Um, an animal that comes in who just might have a hernia that needs to be repaired or, you know, basic things that just add up quickly, you know, urinary tract infections, things like that. We never ask the adopter. I went to see a cardiologist this morning, <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. go figure. Yep. Yeah. So we never ask the adopter to okay. repay us for anything that we've already put into the animal. Um, so a lot of times we're spending a lot more on the animal than we actually recoup in the adoption fee. So it's all from the kindness of our wonderful donors' hearts. Now, are there times of times during the year that you find busier than others? The like, summer is okay. definitely Because I'm just really like wondering, January, us. when all the people who got puppies for Christmas decided that they really can't have yeah. puppies. It usually takes about six months for that. Oh, okay. Um, we so it's we the see, summer. Yeah, we mm -hmm. see a lot of um, adolescent dog surrenders. Um, you know, they're not the tiny little puppies anymore, and people are realizing the work that's involved. Mm -hmm. um, but this, I, for whatever reason, the summer tends to be really busy oh, from okay. about June on through October is okay. really busy. Right now we have a waiting list for dogs to come in. Um, cats we don't usually need to do that for. Other animals we don't, though. Rabbits, rabbits we're a little there. overwhelmed rabbits. with yeah. right now. Adopt a cat, get a rabbit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Adopt so. two, get one free. <laughs> So, um, but the summers are really very busy for us. And now, do rabbits just, I know I was just joking, buy two, get one free. Do rabbits do better with multiple? So rabbits are really social animals, but um, they do have to date to bond, is how I like to put it. <laughs> okay. So you can never just throw two rabbits in together and expect them to get along and be okay. buddies right off the get-go. Um, they really have a dating process, and, you know, quite often we will get in single rabbits, um, and, you know, for adopters to bond them with a rabbit at home, we do, you know, the number one priority would be that they're both spayed and neutered. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. adult bonding with rabbits is definitely the more secure way to go about okay. to find your rabbit now a buddy. Is it better male-female, two females, two yep. males? Yep, spayed female, neutered male is by far the easiest bond. Yeah. Um, okay. So sometimes two rabbits could bond within a month. Um, sometimes it can take a year for two rabbits to truly bond before they become good friends in the household. So it definitely is a process. And then, for example, my rabbit at home, my current rabbit, he's bonded with my two dogs. So um, some rabbits actually bond quicker with other species than they do with okay. each other. So. Now we mentioned fundraisers. We only have a few minutes left, believe mm -hmm. it or not. Okay. Um, you mentioned the need for fundraisers. Do you have any big fundraisers coming up that we might want to look into? We do. Yes. Um, on August 24th, we have a really fun event called Mimosas and Mutts. And <laughs> it's a painting event where you can paint your own dog. We have like artists. paint the dog? Or? Um, not paint the dog, oh. paint a portrait of your own okay. dog. So we have artists lined up um, to help us out with the artist bar at Western Avenue Studios in Lowell. And okay. there'll be a number of artists there and all the supplies will be provided wow. as well as mimosas mm -hmm. and some brunch items. It'll be on a Sunday morning on oh, okay. August 24th. 
and um, you'll bring a photograph of your pet and get some you guidance. Bring the cat, you know, the uh, animal there to sit on the pedestal. No, that would be a little <laughs> rough with all the animals running around. Um, and that'll be a dog specific day. We'll do in oh, that. Okay. We'll do other species later this year. Dogs play but, well um, with each other usually. <laughs> I think they might be hard to sit still and uh, get true. that portrait for. But um, <laughs> yeah, so that day, the you know artist will be there to provide some guidance on making okay. you know painting but a you portrait your of your own animal. Oh, okay. So it's a really fun event that and we're looking said, forward you know, to. Paint the paint the pet and yeah. thinking, you know, those cans of colored hairspray. And yeah, like, no, ooh. portrait of your pet. Um, and then we are also participating in a ri bike ride challenge on September 27th, and we have a really amazing team of over 20 people, volunteers, staff members, as well as some great community members who heard oh, wow. about it and said, we want to support you. So you can go it's right like on our website. Yep, it's um, with the Greater Lowell Community Foundation. Oh. And you can go right on our website and make a donation to our team, or you can click through and see if you recognize anyone um, okay. on the team and uh, make a donation there. Each of our riders have committed to raising at least $100 by the ride. Oh, wow, so, how big's the team? Um, we have 20 riders. Wow. So we're pretty psyched. Um, so yeah, you can Kino's just- has got a surgery. You know, oh. Yeah, <laughs> even if it's a $5 donation, it makes a huge difference, oh, yeah. it adds up. Um, so there's that. And then our really fun event that we, this is our first time planning, is our beer and wine tasting event called Come Sip Stay. And that's October 17th at Western Avenue Studios. Oh, that's in my Lowell. kid's birthday. Oh, no. Ah. <laughs> um, so that'll be a really fun event as well. We'll have beer and wine tastings with um, Tutu Benet, which is a, a wine cellar in oh, Lowell. Okay. And um, we'll have raffles and some really cool silent auction items, sports memorabilia, oh, okay. uh, and l just lots of fun. So, oh, yeah, that's kind of busy, so busy fall planned. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we are just about out of time. Now, if someone wants more information on the Humane Society, on your shelter, where would they go? Hit up our website. It's lowellhumanesociety.org, or you can call us. We love to talk. <laughs> it's 978-9. 452-7781 okay. uh, or you know just really keep up to date on what's happening look for us on Facebook and like I gotta our do page. that as soon as I get home yeah. today yeah we love Facebook we do, <laughs> um, we do <laughs> whoops we do a lot of posts and um you know, photos of animals, and we really, um, we have a new Facebook page called LHS Animal Ambassadors, or uh, Adoption Agents, I'm sorry, oh, LHS okay. Adoption Agents, and you can join that page, and if you can't adopt or donate, all you have to do is print out the flyers we post and hang them up at your post office, your library, the coffee shop, oh, wow. your office, um, you know, it can't get easier than that Share it to on help Facebook. find an animal. <laughs> exactly, so that's a really easy, free way to help us. Excellent. So LHS Adoption Agents is where you can join that. On Facebook. On Facebook, yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, Sherry and Crystal, and thank you for wearing your name tags. It's <laughs> <laughs> our short-term memory. And I have this adorable little cat on my lap. Thank you very much for thanks joining for us. Thanks for having Thanks yeah. for bringing your, your buddies. Yeah, we're always and happy to come. hopefully we will see you again soon. Yeah. yeah. And I do want to thank everyone for tuning in this evening. And hopefully you... If you haven't been encouraged to add to your home and add to your family, please consider doing so. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to seeing you around town and seeing you in a couple of weeks. Thanks and have a great week. Good night. <laughs>